Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I am Emily Knight. I'm manager with the LendFest Ocean Program. For those of you that do not know LendFest, we are a grant-making program that funds research projects and expert working groups to address priority science needs facing ocean and coastal decision makers. Uh, you can learn more about us at LendFestOcean.org and you can sign up for our newsletter there and you can follow us at LendFestOcean on Twitter. For today's agenda, we are very excited to have with us Dr. Charles Green from Cornell University, Dr. Kimberly, Kimberly Davies from Dalhousie University, and Dr. Aaron Meyer Gutbrod from UC Santa Barbara. They are going to be talking about a new project we are funding to explore if food availability is causing range shifts in North Atlantic right whales. I will let the researchers share all of the details, but you know, managers and policymakers are already being challenged by changing ocean conditions. And at LendFest, we are particularly excited about the potential of this project to demonstrate how research, in this case, research into oceanographic shifts, can inform managers and policymakers in ways that enable them to get ahead of changes and develop more proactive measures on behalf of animals and people. So just a few webinar logistics before I turn it over to them. Uh, we have everybody muted, like I said, and that's to present, prevent feedback. Uh, for questions, we will have the researchers do their full presentation, then answer questions at the end. To submit a question, use the Q&A panel to type and submit it. I will read it aloud at the end for the researchers to answer. Uh, you may submit your question at any time throughout the presentation and we will keep track of the queue. Uh, depending on how many questions there are, we may not get to them all, but we definitely welcome folks to follow up with us. So you can see on this slide, my contact is there, Dr. Green's contact is there, and we'll provide the full team's contact information at the end as well. Uh, this project aims to be useful to decisions, thus this webinar is just one way for us to get the word out and encourage folks to reach out to us. So for next steps, we are recording this webinar. Um, in the next couple of weeks, we will make the webinar recording and the PowerPoint slides available online. Uh, once up, um, I will distribute everything. Uh, we have a running distribution list for information about this project. If you are not on that or if you are not sure you are, just send me a note. So at this point, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Charles Green. He is a professor and director of the Ocean Resources and Ecosystems Program at Cornell University. And uh, Dr. Green, I am now about to change over presenter privileges to you. Everything's okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so as I was saying, like the start of many mysteries, uh, ours starts off with the discovery of a body. And in this case, uh, back in the summer of 2017, it was actually many bodies. And these were uh, right whales that were found up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, uh, slightly more than a dozen, which is about 3% of the total right whale population, um, uh, died during that summer, during a brief two-month period. And that raised a couple of questions with us, which is why were these whales in the Gulf of St. Lawrence to begin with, and why did so many of them get killed? So our project is looking at the conservation oceanography of the North Atlantic right whale. And the participants in this project are myself. I'm the director of the Ocean Resources and Ecosystems Program at Cornell. Uh, Aaron Meyer Gutbrod, who's a postdoc at UC Santa Barbara. And Kimberly Davies, 
who is a research oceanographer at Dalhousie University. Now, we're all oceanographers, which is a little bit unusual because most of the time when people look at the conservation of right whales, they're biologists doing it. And what we'd like to convince people today is that oceanographers can actually add quite a bit to our understanding of what it will take to conserve this highly endangered species. So what do we mean by conservation oceanography? Well, basically, it's using an oceanographic perspective Perspective to try to better understand right whale conservation. So if we look at the part of the world where right whales live, we can see that right whales undergo a migration from their cabin grounds in the southeastern bite of the U.S. up to their traditional foraging grounds up in, in the area around the Gulf of Maine. And we're going to focus mostly in this area around the Gulf of Maine, uh, Gulf of St. Lawrence, Scotian Shelf, Gulf of Maine formally itself, uh, George's Bank, and the Middle Atlantic Bight. And these are the areas that, are, again, are the principal foraging areas, but they're also areas that are in a very dynamic physical oceanographic environment. And during our talk today, what we want to do is discuss the complex linkages between climate and that complex dynamical physical oceanography, how that in turn influences the plankton, and how that uh, subsequently influences right whales. And when I talk about climate, we're talking about natural climate variability as well as climate change, anthropogenic climate change. So the question that we're asking today is, how do climate-associated changes in prey availability affect the recovery rate of the North Atlantic right whale population? And this question is something that we've been interested in for over, decade, uh, over two decades. We began studying it in the 1990s um, as part of the U.S. Globex Northwest Atlantic Georgia's Bank Study. And during that time, we realized that much of the information that we were learning about the ecosystems in this part of the world um, would be helpful in helping us better understand what was going on with right whales. Now, in order to study right whales and to try to look at the impacts of, of climate, you need a lot more than a short five to 10 year field study like the GLOBEC program. You really need a long time series or a number of long time series of data to be able to provide a, a climate context for understanding uh, what's going on in the system if you really want to ask questions about climate change and climate variability. Fortunately, we had several long time series of data to work with. One was the continuous plankton recorder survey data from the Gulf of Maine. So for those of you who may not be familiar with it, the continuous plankton recorder was in, invented by uh, Sir Alistair Hardy back in the 1930s, and these instruments are towed um, all over the North Atlantic and in a few other places around the world. Basically, there's an open aperture in the front of the CPR, and the water comes in and the plankton are filtered out on a gauze. There's a stepping motor that moves the gauze along so that we can actually get uh, spatial information. And then there's a transect through the Gulf of Maine that basically starts in New England and goes to Nova Scotia. And that's critically important to our studies today. And those data have been collected since the late 1950s. In addition, the New England Aquarium and, and associates have been collecting data on right whales, running surveys that go back to the early 1980s. And what we can see here, these are um, all of the uh, observations, uh, these little black dots. And you can see these areas in the hashed red. Uh, those are the critical habitat uh, where right whales are foraging. And as you can see, if we go up to the Gulf of St. Lawrence, there aren't very many whales that have actually uh, been observed there uh, in the surveys uh, prior to the current, uh, to the recent years. 
Now, back in, in 2004, um, Andrew Pershing was a graduate student of mine at the time, and I wrote a paper trying to link this animal, Calanus finmarchicus, to the reproduction of right whales. And in particular, Calanus is considered one of the primary uh, sources of nutrition for right whales. And we had continuous plankton recorder from the Gulf of Maine on Calanus. And we were able to put together a simple model following right whales through right whale females through the different stages from recovering, which is between pregnancies, to pregnant, to uh, nursing with a, with a new calf. And each one of these transitions occurs about a year apart. And what we can do is we can uh, estimate the transitional probabilities of moving from one state to the next. Um, and we did that by driving it with this Calum's abundance data from the continuous plankton recorder. So this is a time series basically starting in the early 1980s and going up to about 2009. And we can see this is the, these are the changes in calanus abundance and the blue area is two, uh, plus or minus two standard errors. Um, and basically what we're doing, we're using that to drive a, a, a model to estimate these transitional probabilities so that as calanus abundance goes up, the transitional probability increases until it, it levels off. And when we use that simple model to predict the calving rate of right whales, we can see it does a pretty good job. It predicts the, um, the uh, relatively um, low variability observed during the 1980s. Um, and then we can see during the 1990s, um, there was um, a sharp increase um, in the um, sort of in the middle to late part of the 1990s, and then there was a dramatic drop. And we can see that the model does a pretty good job of predicting that. So at the time, back in at around 1999, there was a, a lot of uh, concern in the literature that the right whale population was predicted to go extinct. There were only about 300 animals in the population. Um, and an estimate uh, by Fujiwara and Caswell was that this population would go extinct uh, sometime in the next 200 years. But that information doesn't seem to have been conveyed to the right whales because in the first decade of the 2000s, it actually, of the 2000s, it actually turned out to be a relatively good time for right whales. So although it seemed to go largely unnoticed in the media, the North Atlantic right whale population rebounded strongly during this decade. And as you can see over here, if we look at the population size, after it had been relatively level during the 1990s, it steeply increased during this first decade of the 2000s. And if we look at the number of calves born in a year, you can see that in the 1990s it was relatively low, and then it more than doubled during that first decade of the 2000s. So what's going on in the current decade? Well, there's a lot of question marks. Um, the CPR survey samples were no longer analyzed because of budget cuts that NOAA incurred. And so while the samples were continued to be collected, uh, they were not analyzed and are sitting on the, sh on the shelves in, uh, in Plymouth, UK at the Marine Biological Association. Um, and so we've sort of been flying blind during the last decade. And this is really unfortunate because the Gulf of Maine has been going, undergoing an unprecedented warming during this time. And we also know that the right whales were starting to change their migration patterns. And they were also going back into uh, similar uh, calving rates as we had seen in the 1990s, and, and things even look worse in the past year. So with that, I'm going to um, turn this over to our next speaker. Thank you, thank you everyone, for coming. Um, so just uh, picking up where Chuck left off, I'm going to talk about um, the uh, contemporary uh, distribution of right whales, uh, especially focusing on um, Canadian waters, uh, 
uh, due to the, uh, the crisis in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So what you see um, in this picture at the, at, at the top here is a very few uh, sightings of North Atlantic right whales in much of Canadian waters. And that um, is a reflection partly of the fact that we've had very little dedicated monitoring of right whales uh, in Canadian waters um, prior to uh, 2017. Um, so uh, when right whales started to shift their distribution, um, it was really unknown where to even start looking for them because this is just such a huge um, area to search. Um, so we first had some idea that um, we needed to go looking for, for right whales because it was actually happening in the Bay of Fundy. So this uh, graph here uh, shows the, uh, rel a relative index of abundance of right whales uh, in a, the Bay of Fundy feeding habitat. And just to point you to 2010 to 2015 here, um, the, the sightings had, have declined significantly um, over the last eight years, reaching an all-time low uh, in 2013 in this time series. It might even have been lower in 2016. Um, at the same time, uh, the seasonal occurrence in the Bay of Fundy has been changing as well. The animals have gradually been arriving earlier and earlier. And um, these shifts, uh, while really prominent in the Bay of Fundy time series because it goes back all the way to the 80s, um, they, they've also been evident in other feeding grounds. So there's been a decline in occurrence in the spring in Great South Channel and uh, an increase in occurrence in, in Cape Cod Bay in winter. So this points to really a large scale change in the migration patterns of the animals that's presumably driven by food. Um, and indeed, there are signs of changes in food supply. What you see on the graph, this graph here, this is what we call an anomaly plot. It shows the anomalies of late stage Calanus and Marchicus in the Bay of Fundy. and um, you see year on the y-axis here and month on the x-axis. And if you just follow this black line, it, it uh, follows the average peak abundance. And you can see that since 2010, that average has been shifting earlier. And you see these blue, a lot of blue squares in the fall. That indicates negative anomalies, so the abundance is relatively lower now. And in the spring, the abundance has actually been increasing, so we have signs of potentially um, of, of changing phenology in, uh, in Calanus and Marchicus, which is the major um, prey species, which could possibly indicate a mismatch with the timing of, of whale migration. Um, there are a lot of questions you know, around what uh, might be driving uh, these changes in, in food supply, and we need, certainly need to investigate this over a larger space and time scales, and uh, the CPR data set's a really good way of doing that. Um, so the big question back in 2015, where are summer foraging grounds for right whales? And what you see on the top here is um, the survey, a, a map of survey effort, the number of years that each little grid, five minute grid cell here has been surveyed. Uh, you can see there's a lot of survey effort almost annually in Roseway Basin and annually in Graham and Ann Basin, but not a whole lot anywhere else. So in 2015, a collaborative survey effort from among a lot of organizations across Canada and the U.S. was undertaken um, to, to, to find right whale habitats, and that was not um, that was not sort of a random search. Uh, we were searching based on um, the oceanographic indicators of uh, dormant stage Calanus Marchicus habitat. And right whales in Canadian waters in late summer, they're looking for deep dive housing uh, Calanus. This is a life stage that's very energy rich. Um, and they tend to collect in basins and channels. So. Um, we directed uh, aerial surveillance to a couple of these areas in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and there was a high-use area that was discovered there. And um, when the mortality event occurred in that area, that actually led to a really strong um, expansion of dedicated survey effort um, in that region. So we're starting to now fill in some of these data gaps in Canadian waters um, 
uh, that, that there were before 2015. Um, so our group has been uh, undertaking uh, prey field surveys in the southern Gulf for the past two years and uh, collecting net samples of, of zooplankton near foraging right whales. Um, what you see on the right is just some preliminary data from those, uh, those surveys. You've got concentration on the y-axis at 16 different stations in the Gulf on the x-axis. You're looking at concentrations of two species, Calanus femarchicus which is a, a temperate boreal species, and that's the species we think of as being the main prey source for, for right whales. We also have uh, a related species, Calanus hyperboreus, here, and these two species um, tend to make up more than 90% you know, of the biomass. Um, now, Calanus hyperboreus is an Arctic uh, species, and um, there's been some um, uh, question of whether they may be uh, making up a significant part of the right whale diet. But what we've been finding so far um, is that Calanus formarticus is still the dominant species near feeding right whales um, by an order of magnitude in terms of abundance. And so this suggests a continued reliance for, of right whales on prey species um, from temperate regions within their core feeding range um, and, and indicates that these animals may be um, migrating further north because they're searching for this preferred prey. Um, and um, that is some concern because under different climate change scenarios, Calanus sinmarchicus um, is predicted to be extirpated from some of these really um, important right whale habitats in future years. And um, there's some really important questions that we would like to address. For example, are right whales moving north to be closer to Calanus source waters? Um, due to changes in, in the advective supply from source waters in places like the Labrador Sea down to the Gulf of Maine? And are there habitat refugia in more northern areas under future climate change scenarios? Right whales require a very particular regional uh, and, and patch scale um, oceanographic conditions to, to, to be able to um, uh, accumulate enough energy. And so um, the interaction between the climate, the regional, and the patch scale is going to be important for, for answering that question. So this is a, a timeline of the mortality crisis that occurred um, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And just to, to give people who um, may not uh, have a lot of uh, experience with Canadian uh, conservation, um, there have been a number of conservation efforts in Canadian waters between 1993 and 2009 to protect right whales, primarily focused in Graminam Basin and Roseway Basin. Um, but then in 2017, when the animals began to, um, to get in trouble, uh, the government started to introduce new unprecedented measures, such as very large slowdown zones, um, uh, fisheries closure, area closures, and um, other uh, restrictions on, on fishing gear. And so this is really a new era of, of conservation management in Canada um, in 2018 that was really precipitated by this mortality crisis um, and really demonstrates um, that, uh, you know, adaptive and dynamic uh, responses to uh, changes in right whale distribution and especially unexpected changes um, is really important for um, protecting the species into the future. And so just some take home messages. Climate change um, in the future may throw some curveballs at us as we make our best attempts at managing uh, right whales as, as well as other protected species. And you know, understanding the oceanographic processes that are driving um, changes in distribution is really important um, for anticipating changes to management and um, developing management plans. OK. Hello? OK, turning right, it over to you, Aaron, now. Uh, thanks so much, Kim and Chuck, and thanks to Emily, our host at LensFest. I'm going to share my screen. Everybody can see those? Yep. We can. Great. 
Um, so we've talked a lot today about right whales and about prey, the food that they eat. And we all know food is important, um, but we especially focus on how prey availability affects reproduction, which Chuck alluded to a bit in a couple of his slides. And the reason that we do that is because, first of all, reproduction is very energ energetically demanding. Um, the stages of pregnancy and especially the stages of lactation require so much energy that females that are in those states need to find a lot more food than other right whales do. And another challenge that they're facing is the reproducing females. So all the, all the time that they're eating is spent up here in the northern waters, in the Gulf of Maine and off the Scotian Shelf, and then now maybe in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. But a reproducing female will have to migrate south to the calving grounds off of Florida and Georgia. And this migration takes a couple of months. And during that whole time when they're migrating and giving birth, they don't have access to prey. So they both need higher access to prey and they have a, a smaller portion of the year that they can forage. And that's why reproduction is especially prey dependent relative to other states of a right whale's life cycle. Let's see. Advancing. Um, and so Chuck talked about this a bit as well. The, the broad picture is we're looking at how the climate changes the physical oceanography, so it changes how the water moves. And that impacts the plankton, Calinus and Marchicus, that right whales eat because it can change the local environment. It can change the stratification of the water. Um, and it can also change how the currents move and how many of these plankton get advected into the foraging habitats of the right whales. Like in the Gulf of Maine, um, most of the plankton in there, the colonists, don't live there year round and replenish themselves through reproduction. They instead get kind of blown in by the currents. So when the currents change, uh, a smaller amount of these plankton get blown into the Gulf of Maine. Um, and then that, of course, affects right whales, especially through, repro through, through reproduction. Um, and so a few years ago, we updated that model that Chuck introduced, um, which looks specifically at how prey affects reproduction through those three stages. And females can transition from, oops, from a resting state to a pregnant state to a nursing state, and the probability of moving between those states is dependent on prey. And the model was both updated in terms of time, but also it was made a little bit more sophisticated by breaking the CPR, the continuous plankton recorder data that we have measuring colonist abundances in the Gulf of Maine. It broke it into different regions and different seasons to see what portions of prey are most important for reproducing females, uh, which was pretty exciting. Um, and we see, of course, that prey availability through the measured through the continuous plankton recorder does have, oh, my slides are out of control, does have a strong effect on um, the reproduction. So on the left, you can see the CPR data in the 80s. There was a lot of copepods in the Gulf of Maine in the 90s, the lines are blue. That's because there were fewer copepods around. Um, and then in the 2000s, the copepods came back. And then right below the Calinus time series that you see, you can see this is a right whale calving index. So this is the number of calves born in a year as a function of the number of females that were available to give birth. So it's kind of a reproductive efficiency index. And it maps really clearly onto the changes in prey with um, a lot of calves born in the 80s and 2000s. And then when prey collapsed in the 1990s, calf births went way down. And over here we have a time series of total right whale population. And you can see good growth in the 80s and in the 2000s, but the right whale population growth slows down a lot in the 1990s. And one of the reasons for this reduction in growth is because of that slowdown in the birth rate. Um, so the results of that model um, were pretty great. So here I've got the same time series that we've been looking at, 1980 to 2010. 
And this top figure is how Calanus changes in the Gulf of Maine as measured through the continuous plankton recorder. And then these bottom two graphs are the number of calves born, and that's the black line right here, is the number of calves born over the time series. So that line is the same in the top and bottom. Um, but the colored lines are the model predictions. So in this middle panel with the blue model, um, that's what the model looks like if you don't include prey when you're following females as they transition between those reproductive states. And so you can see there's a general trend of increasing calf births, which is following the growth in the total female population, but we're not seeing much of the interannual variability. And then here, especially because we've looked at the regions and seasons in the Gulf of Maine that are most important to right whale reproduction, the model performs much better at predicting calf births. So that's this, these red lines here. Um, is the model predicted number of births each year. And it, of course, it follows the general upward trend because the female population is growing, so there's more opportunity to produce calves. But we also see most of the interannual variability, years where many of the females give birth and then years where few of the females give birth is captured because we allowed those probabilities to be a function of that CPR data. Um, so calves are all well and good, but most people are worried about the population as a whole and not just a small portion of it. So that's something that we did was throw the calving model into a bigger model that follows the entire right whale population. So we're not going to go into the details of this, but there's a lot of states in the right whale life cycle. So we have the pink circles are for females and the blue are for males. We have mortality rates. We have prey-dependent reproduction going on, and the results are pretty striking, which we've seen over a 30-year time series over here on the right. The population growth has gone from essentially zero. 1.0 means that there's no population growth, um, up to 1.04, which means there's about a 4% population growth in a given year. And the reason that population growth goes from no growth at all to a reasonable rate um, that indicates the population may be bouncing back is because the breeding probability, the, the probability of having a calf changes so dramatically. So in the years when prey is lowest, the chance of giving birth is 10%, and when prey is highest, it's closer to 40%, which is a really dramatic change. And when we build models like that, we have the opportunity to project right whale growth forward under a whole range of situations. But that's what everybody wants to know is, how do we think the right whales are going to do in the future? Is the population doing well? Is it a big concern? Um, and so these projections are very useful. And what we found is that in times when prey is low, the right whales, of course, are more vulnerable to population decline because the calving rates are down. Um, and then add on top of the prey-dependent calving rates, we have potential changes in anthropogenic mortality rates. So that's what this projection looks at. Um, here, we're assuming that the prey is low, as low as we've seen in the 1990s. So the right whales aren't producing very quickly. And then when you increase the anthropogenic mortality rates, like what happened last year, the population can decline. So with no additional deaths, the population is growing quite well. But when you add 10 deaths a year, the population starts to decline towards extinction. Now remember, last year had 17 deaths, so 10 is a lot less than 17. Last year was a year of population decline and definitely a big concern. Um, and of course, what Kim was talking about is we've seen these right whales up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence a lot in the past couple of years. So Kim is actually a part of a project that's happening at Dalhousie and is led by Dr. Chris Taggart called the Whales Habitat and Listening Experiment. And they are putting gliders in the water that are listening for right whales, and they're able to detect a right whale call relative to a different kind of baleen whale call. And so this, I just took a screenshot from an app that they have on the web um, that's live. 
and I took this last week. So we can see up here that there's plenty of right whales sighted last week in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And the red dots are those that were um, sighted, quote unquote, acoustically. So they were heard. So right whales were heard by the gliders. So this goes to show the whales are up there in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So the previous work we've been doing, um, modeling reproduction based off of the Gulf of Maine prey availability, it, we need to change how we're approaching this. Um, something that we've noticed, of course, last year, there was the big mortality event, um, but there's been kind of a steady decline in the calf count. Uh, in the first decade of the 2000s, we saw calf births that were in the 20s and sometimes in the 30s. So really good numbers of calves were born. And then in the past few years, those numbers have declined to single digits or teens. And in the 2017 year, only five calves were born. And last year, which some of you might be aware, not a single calf was sighted. So it seems like the number for this year is zero. And based off of what we've been describing, how we know reproduction and prey are intimately linked, this leads us to the idea that there is some change in the prey that's driving this decline in calf rates. So what we're doing with LensFest is we're updating the continuous plankton recorder. Our data only went through 2011, um, and there has been data collected through 2017, but it's just sitting unprocessed. So once we get that data processed in the next few months, we'll be able to apply it to these types of demographic models to see if we can explain the changes in reproduction that we've observed and figure out how that corresponds to overall the population's growth. Now, of course, the right whales aren't spending all their time in the Gulf of Maine anymore. Um, so one thing that we're interested in doing is working with scientists at the DFO in Canada and incorporating some of the longer term Canadian data sets that are at sampling stations. Um, there's a couple in particular that we're interested in. The Shadiac buoy um, sampling station is up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and there's a station here on the Halifax line. And at both of these stations, there's a roughly monthly ringnet toes that count Calanus finmarchicus and other species. So we can use those in addition to our updated continuous plankton recorder data in the Gulf of Maine to figure out if maybe prey somewhere else in these new habitats that the right whales are using um, can do a better job of explaining the changes that we're seeing in the population's growth. And what I think is gonna end up happening is there's going to be a, we'll need a combination of prey data sets. We'll have to capture sort of the whole spatial range the Gulf of Maine, the Scotian Shelf, and the Gulf of St. Lawrence, if we're going to do a good do job of understanding how the population has changed. So sort of to wrap things up, the questions that we are asking, we're going to use our updated continuous plankton recorder data. We're going to partner with the DFO and look at some of the sampling stations up there and try and figure out how has climate moved around and changed the abundance of these copepods, the, the zooplankton that right whales feed on. And how in turn does that explain the shifts that we've seen? We've seen distributional shifts with the right whales moving up into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. We've seen changes in prey availability has probably in, in, impacted calving rates. So how has that changed the number of births each year? And how can we use that to predict how the population is going to grow or go extinct? And it may be possible that with continued monitoring of the zooplankton, we can predict how the right whales are going to behave and how their population is going to change. And through these predictions, we may be able to avoid a crisis similar to what we experienced last year. And that's ultimately the goal that we have in this project. So I'm going to pass it off to Chuck to wrap us up. So our project is asking if food availability is, is causing these observed rain, sh rain shifts in right whales. And specifically, our project's asking the following questions. 
Why have the numbers of North Atlantic right whales been increasing in the Gulf of St. Lawrence? Is this northward shift of the North Atlantic right whale population related to a northward shift in the distribution of its prey? And where in the Gulf of St. Lawrence has the abundance of North Atlantic right whales been increasing? So these are all sort of the fundamental questions that we're hoping to answer in the next few years with this uh, LENFAST Ocean Program project. Um, and basically, our, our project analyzing this decade's uh, collected, our project will be analyzing this decade's collected but unprocessed continuous plankton recorder samples. And in terms of the next steps, uh, basically we hope to get all of the data from the CPR samples uh, that were collected through March of 2017, analyzed at the Marine Biological Association of the UK in Plymouth. Um, and we hope to get these data uh, by the summer of 2019. We're planning to have another data analysis and modeling meeting next summer at Friday Harbor Labs in Friday Harbor, Washington. And one of the fundamental things that we're hoping to do is we're still looking to find somebody to step up and so start supporting the restart of the CPR survey in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, in March 2017, they discontinued even collecting the samples on that CB CPR survey line. Uh, so everybody is sort of flying blind. And it turns out that it only costs $65,000 a year to run that survey line. And this is a time series that goes back to the late 1950s. So it's, it's an incredible, uh, incredibly valuable uh, treasure trove of data. And I hope that we can figure out a way to get it supported again. So on that, I'm going to finish up and ask people uh, to share their questions with us. Great. Thank you so much, Chuck. And we're going to dive into some of the questions in the Q&A panel. So for our first question uh, from Hadil Ibrahim, how effective were the Canadian conservation efforts, the slowdown zones, et cetera? Do you guys, can you guys talk a little bit about uh, how effective it was that what the Canadians did in response to the mortality event? Um, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, you know, from a, a scientist's perspective, um, the uh, this year there were no deaths, um, and there were there were two entanglements, but they were they occurred after the the snow crab fishery uh, and lobster fishery had closed in that area for the year. Um, so, in terms of just relative comparison between um, no management in 2017. Um, in early 2017, excuse me, and um, and a significant uh, management program in 2018. It, it appears to be um, to have been quite successful in in reducing the the number of mortalities. And certainly, that has been the message from uh, from the federal government to the public. Thanks, Kim. And we have a follow up question on that. It's from Hadil, how temporary permanent should the Canadian conservation efforts be? That's obviously more of a management and policy question that, you know, we can't get into here. But I did want to give uh, Chuck and, and everybody a chance to speak to, again, if you want to say a little more about how the project could help um, inform managers as they do plan, even though we don't, you know, exactly know what they should do. I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to hand this off to my colleagues right now because a fire alarm <laughs> just went off in my building. Oh, no. So I have to oh, no. evacuate. <laughs> well, what um, can you do? sure. Yeah, I mean, I can speak to that. So the the main goal that Chuck and Kim and I are working on here is, as Emily kind of mentioned, is building the science that can go to inform management. Um, so of course. Um, there's 
Uh, that's where the use of some of these forward projections are. When we can understand what are the situations where the right whales are doing well, are recovering, versus when is it that they might be declining towards extinction into the future. Um, that's, that's important in kind of helping managers understand when is it that we need to start applying policies. And of course, some of that is pretty clear when you come across 17 bodies next year, or last year, I mean. Um, but when you can factor in these other things, like how are there changes in shipping rates and shipping patterns? How are there changes in climate? And how is that moving their prey around? We can get sort of a sense of what's happening in the future. And that's something that Chuck alluded to in his first couple of slides. We have been following the situation with right whales and their prey pretty closely in the Gulf of Maine. And then when there wasn't enough funding to process the CPR data, the continuous plankton recorder, we lost that insight into the right whale ecology that has been really helpful. So that's something that I guess the scientists are trying to tell the managers is help us help you. Um, when we don't have these data streams, then we're blind. And the best way to figure out what's happening with the right whales is just by counting the bodies, unfortunately. I know, Kim, if you have something more to say. No, I think you said it really well, Erin. Thanks, guys. We have a question from uh, Jean Lantain, uh, which I believe you answered, Erin. Um, right. You know, are, are any, did any calves appear this year? And I believe the answer is no, is that correct? Yeah, the answer is no. Um, you know, of course, it's possible that in another year we'll see a young, a juvenile whale that seems to be about the right size to indicate that it was born this year and it was missed. But um, at least in the 30 plus years that we've been monitoring the right whales, that's not usually how it happens. Uh, calves are the easiest for the observation team to cite for a number of reasons. So it, it really does look like there aren't any calves that were born this past winter. Okay, we have a question from Peter Thomas. Uh, the other alternative explanation for reduced female reproduction is the energetic cost of non-lethal entanglement. How do you reconcile this against the prey shift and decline hypotheses? Yeah, um, that's, that's a really insightful observation. And it's something that there's actually been a little bit of research on. Um, just a couple years ago, Julie Vanderhoop published a paper that was looking at entanglement as potentially another life history stage that should be con included in these demographic models. And I think that she made a really good point. So it's um, tricky, of course, to include because we don't know all the right whales that are entangled. And um, sometimes we can see changes through photographs um, in scarring on individuals that can help us infer um, what years entanglement incurred. Like if you see a whale this year and then next year you see the whale with a brand new scar, you can assume that that whale was entangled at some point last year. I mean, ship strikes are another possibility. But um, that, that's something that we should consider is including entanglement as a potential, even if it's a hidden life stage in some of these models. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is from uh, James Grieg. With the range of right whales potentially changing, what impact with bowhead habitats and feeding behavior impacts the movement of the right whales? Um, Kim, I don't, I don't know if you want to talk about this a little, um, but I will say I think there's some potential in overlap in prey interest between right whales and bowhead. And that's, that, that's really the only interaction that I can think of right now is if there's competition for the same prey, is there gonna be less prey available for right whales because they're competing with bowheads? Um, but it's important to remember that these big 
kind of charismatic baleen whales are not the only things that are competing for Calanus and Marchicus or Calanus hyperboreus in these waters. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of opening up a whole other can of worms, but that is something that could potentially be done is building more of a huge ecosystem model and seeing how changes of other species are contributing as well as shifts in climate and physical oceanography to changes in these copepod abundances. I, yeah. I'm back on. <laughs> oh. I'm back on now. I just wanted to add to that. Remember, we're we're talking about a population of only 500 whales, so the impact of those 500 whales on the abundance of calanus is is pretty small in the Gulf of Maine. So at at this point in time, or in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So at this point in time, I don't think that uh, right whales would be an important competitor. Um, in terms of reducing the abundance of uh, prey for, for bowheads, but there, there could be other ways that they could interact. Thanks, and, and good to have you back. Um, so the next question is from Sarah Gibbons. Beyond reversing the rate of warming waters, what sort of measures could be taken to help right whales access more of their prey and have a more successful population? Um, I, I think I can take that. Uh, so sometimes when I give talks about this topic, I joke that it would be great, but it's just not feasible to truck a load of calanus and dump it in front of a feeding right whale. And that's the kind of intervention that you know your imagination could go to, but it's not possible um, on a scale. It's even remotely useful. Um, but, of course, that's why a lot of the policy actions that have been taken both in the U.S. and in Canada, especially in the past year, are focusing on anthropogenic mortalities. Of course, we can reduce the overlap between right whales and fishing gear. So sometimes that means pulling gear out of the water or it means being cognizant of what time of year the right whales like to be in a place and see if you can minimize the overlap between when that fishery is open and when the right whales are present. We can change um, shipping routes and reduce shipping speeds, and there's a lot of evidence that uh, especially changes with shipping can be very successful in reducing mortality rates. But the reason that including prey, I think, is so incredibly important when we're trying to understand the whole species, even though we have a lot more that we can do to mitigate mortality, than we can do to improve reproduction. Clearly, uh, that's, that's where our power lies. But if we're not following both sides of the stories, the birth, the birth side and the death side, then when we introduce a policy, um, such as changing a shipping route or, or instituting a, a slowdown zone, and then we see a change in the right whale population, we're not going to be able to attribute changes in the population to changes in policy unless we know how the whole population is responding. So that means we have to take this holistic view where we incorporate prey, incorporate reproduction, and incorporate mortality before we can sort of pinpoint what policies are working and what policies are less successful. Great, thank you. Um, We'll take just a couple more questions. We're getting towards the end here, but the next is from Dan Zukowski. Have you or will you also be looking at changes in the Labrador current and the Gulf Stream and how they may be affecting plankton distribution? I, I guess I can, I can take that one. Um, we're already seeing uh, changes going on in the Gulf Stream. We're not sure exactly why this has occurred, but the Gulf of Maine during this past decade has been warming faster than 99% of the world ocean. And we do know um, when we look at physical oceanography on a global scale that one of the predictions of a warming planet is that the um, meridional overturning circulation of the world ocean is slowing down, or that's one of the predictions, and in fact, there's some evidence that it is slowing down, and one of the consequences of that is that it will 
lead to a slowing down of the Gulf Stream. When the Gulf Stream slows down, um, it starts to meander more. And we've also seen the shifts in the meanders sort of from further offshore moving towards the coast. And I believe that that may be what's happening is that we're getting more intrusions of the Gulf Stream up onto the shelf, and that's why we're seeing this warming occurring in the shelf waters from the Mid-Atlantic bite up into the Gulf of Maine. Um, so, yes, there, this is a really, as I said at the beginning, this is a very dynamic area of the ocean. Uh, the Gulf Stream is definitely undergoing some changes. We also have a number of other things that are going on. Uh, we know that there's natural modes of, of uh, climate variability that affect the, um, the uh, Labrador current. Um, but we also, and, and some of those result in uh, export of fresh water from the Arctic uh, into, the, into the North Atlantic. Uh, but the, and that, that does occur as a natural process, but we're also seeing all sorts of unusual things happening in the Arctic uh, because of the amplified effects of, of climate warming there. And we know that there's an unusual amount of uh, fresh water being stored in the Arctic, and when that lets loose um, and it gets exported into the North Atlantic, it's going to have a lot of uh, impacts downstream. So, yeah, we're, we're kind of keeping our eyes open, and I think we're likely to see a lot of surprises in the coming years. Uh, some of them hopefully will be in a, in a good position to monitor and, and maybe make some predictions about how that will impact right well. Great. Thank you so much, Chuck. And we are right at 2.59, so we are going to end here, though we have captured some of the remaining questions uh, that came in, and, and we will share them with the, uh, with the researchers. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. You can see on the slide in, from, in front of you our contact information, both at LENFEST and the research team. Um, like I said, this has been recorded, and we will put it up on our website and send it around. Um, and feel free to reach out to any one of us if you have uh, any questions, ideas, comments, whatever it is. We will be continuing to share information about this project as it progresses. So thank you so much, everybody. And that concludes our webinar today. Hi, everybody. I thought that thank went you. really well.